So I'm playing again with my 3D printer and I'm trying to come up with something new and different. I hope this works. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs and the Idiot Quilter, and welcome to my weekly vlog, vlog number 306, for Monday, March the 6th, 2023. Hope everybody had a good week. Hope those of you that got the snow like we did here on the weekend uh, have dug yourself out of it now. In fact, here, after Walter spent about two hours snow blowing it in everybody else's driveway, it's now melting, which is good. Good, because we're coming up to spring soon and we are done. Done with this snow. Okay, so let's, speaking of done, let's see what I've been doing with projects that are sort of done. Uh, this one is not sort of done. It looks done, but it's not done. This is my block of the month that I've been working on for seven, eight. Did we just get, no, this was month six, I think we're up to. So six months we've been working on this. It's called Color Splash. I really love it. It's going to be a spectacular looking quilt when it's done, but it is a lot of applique. All those things that look sort of like flower petals are all individually applique, machine applique onto this quilt. Yeah, they're going to be machine applique because if I was to pick up a sewing needle, well, this quilt would be one color and one color only, red, because it'd be dripping in my blood. So it's coming along nicely. Uh, there's two more installments to this one. Although the instructor, Donna, with, Donna, the hostess with the mostest from Ultimate Sewing, who's teaching this online to us, uh, she's going to combine the next two months into one month because she said basically the last month is just a black border. But <laughs> the, the one before that black border is going to be another border and it's going to look just like this little border around this centerpiece, all these multicolored squares. Now I will confess... Those are not individually sewn. They are done in strips that are cut and then put together. But nevertheless, there's going to be a lot of that to make. And it's going to go all the way around the outside of what you see right now. So, yeah, it's a big quilt, a big job. But I'm really happy with the way that it's turning out. Uh, another project was one of my own creation. I had a lot of very pretty scraps left over from the mosaic star quilt which is a stephanie stitches design that i did some time ago uh if you remember or maybe you don't but i had a lot of those scraps left over and i they're so pretty i didn't want to get rid of them they came from a collection of fabrics that walter bought me um not this past christmas but the christmas before and i was waiting for the perfect quilt to sew them into and i found stephanie's design and it's a spectacular looking quilt but i had these pieces left over so I just started making more star, more stars, and there's a secondary pattern, as you can see in the center coming out here. That's a thread. I missed that when I was taking the picture. And then I had in my stash, I had been playing around with my AccuQuilt with a die that makes what's called a Lemoyne star. And I had a bunch of these, just basically orphan blocks. So I thought I'd sew them in, incorporate them. They were a different size, but we'll talk more about how I got the pieces to fit together tomorrow on Idiot Quilter. And then I added some borders. And so this is the top done. Um, sometime this week, I will put it on Lucy and get it all quilted. And then I just have to bind it. But I'm really kind of happy with the way this turned out. Given the fact that I did not have a plan. I just went with the flow, using up scraps, using orphan blocks, that kind of thing. So I called this one Wild Stars. I wonder why. But anyways, yeah, so that's another one. So I want to get on with uh, another project. Uh, after I get those quilted, I don't like having UFOs laying around. They bother me. So I'll get these projects done. And then I'm going to start, I think, on the one that I was talking about on Idiot Quilter a week or so ago called Healing Waters with the Indigenous Fabric. So, yeah, I want to get a start on that. And I just got thinking the other day, I've got a kit, a, a very beautiful kit. The fabrics in it are absolutely gorgeous um, that I bought last fall when we went around to, to London, Ontario area and did all that shopping. And I got this one kit. 
Um, it's fairly involved by looks of things, but I think it'll make a beautiful quilt. But more about that in Idiot Quilter. So let's move on to YouTube Channel of the Week. And if you love humor, and I do, uh, and I love to watch lots of things on YouTube that make me laugh, well, these this is a site that actually uh, it takes excerpts from a very popular British television show called Spitting Image. And you may have heard me talk about it before, but here's what that's all about. This week's YouTube channel is another one that deals with some mindless entertainment that is really, really funny. And if you like British humor, you're going to love this. And it's called Spitting Image. And what's really different about this uh, channel is it has excerpts from a program that's very popular, I think, in the UK called Spitting Image, where they do parodies and poke fun at major celebrities and politicians uh, in the UK and beyond. And these are basically sort of like a form of puppet. I guess they are puppets, but it is hilarious. And the one that I really saw just recently was the one about Harry and Oops. That's not where I want to go, but there we go. It's uh, the very best of Harry and Meghan, and it is hilarious, especially if you have read uh, Harry's book, the uh, memoirs uh, called The Spare. Um, you'll get the humor even more so if you've read the book. But Spitting Image is a really a great YouTube channel to check out uh, because it's a commentary on the politics of the day and at the same time is just outrageously funny. So you will find a link for that YouTube channel in the show notes below. You will find a link for uh, my on-demand sewing kind of thing, which I think I'm going to be changing um, to something that I think is a little bit more efficient, but more about that tomorrow on the Idiot Quilter. Um, and by the way, the reason I say more about those kind of things that are much more quilting related is because I know people who watch the vlog are not necessarily quilters. So I don't want to waste your time talking about something you're not interested in. You may not be interested in anything I talk about. Well, that's a story for another day. Um, also, for my quilting friends out there, uh, just a reminder that on Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, it's so with Stephanie and Stephen for about an hour and a half. So you can tune into that. And the link for that is below as well. Um, you will find links for last week's uh, blogs that I put up and, uh, and for Stephen and Walter Live as well. So if you missed any of those and you want to see them, the links are right there in the show notes. So that takes me to looking out my window this morning. If I can find my picture here. Here it is. and. Uh, yeah, as I said, we got a lot of snow on the weekend on Saturday. Uh, Saturday was pretty much snowed us in, but a lot of that snow has disappeared since. Um, the weather, the temperature got a little warmer, and yeah, so it's going. It's going away, and that'll be great because I think it's next Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, around 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, we are springing ahead. We change our clocks here in the area I live in, in, in Ontario, Canada. Uh, so we're going to be going ahead an hour. Um, I think a lot of people in the world, and I'm one of them, would love to get rid of that whole time change, you know, fall back, spring ahead kind of a thing. Um, but the powers that be do not want to disrupt that. They don't want to be the first to do it. There are other places in the world even right here in Canada, that do not do the time change thing. And, well, it would just make life easier if we didn't have to bother with that, you know. It's really kind of a pointless thing, I think, in this day and age of, you know, electricity and all that kind of thing. So, anyways, hopefully it's going to start getting a little warmer. We'll see the end of the white stuff and maybe some grass and then eventually it'll leaves on the trees and warmer weather that would be nice current temperature right now when i'm recording this is minus one celsius not horrible but you know minus one celsius and 20 celsius are very different <laughs> so hoping for warmer weather soon okay so that takes me to what's pissing me off this week well You've heard me talk about customer service before, and this is kind of on the same line. 
Um, you're probably tired of me talking about something that, you know, I'm probably singing to the choir because we all have our our um, stories about bad customer service and things. But what really I think contributes to bad customer service is not that because individuals are necessarily being nasty to us, although that's what it seems to be. It's because the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. I'll give you an example of what I mean. We're having some problems with our shower stall. Our shower stall was made by bath fitters. You may have seen the commercials. They're everywhere on TV, at least in North America, because they're across North America. They're essentially a company that comes in and puts a kind of like a one piece shower insert or bath insert into your house. In our case, it was a shower insert. Um, and it isn't one piece. They come in and they install it. They say they do it in one day. They don't, at least not in our experience, but when we had ours first put in and we had it put in about 15 years ago, um, it took them several days to put it in. But the whole idea of it is you don't have to then worry about grouting, you know, because occasionally if you use your shower stall a lot, and we do every day, minimum of two showers a day in there, you know, two people here, using the same shower stall. Um, Walter occasionally had to get out and re-crout, re -grout, not crout, re-grout <laughs> uh, the walls and stuff. And, you know, it's a little more difficult to keep it clean. So with this insert, for lack of a better word, um, it eliminates all of that. And it's great. It is. It's really great. But the base unit around by the drain has cracked over time. Now, they have a lifetime warranty, though. And do they stick to it? Yes, they do. I don't have any complaints about that. Although there are a few loopholes that we know about that we work around. I'm not going to get into those. But nevertheless, we had after about 10 years, I think we had it installed in 2003 is when it was installed originally. In 2013, we had to have the base unit replaced because it was cracking. They did that. Didn't cost us a cent. Okay, great. Now, 10 years later, again, <laughs> we have to have it replaced again. Seems like they have about an 8 to 10 year lifespan. And so they ordered the part and everything like that. And we were waiting for a month for them to you know, get the part and the base and get it arranged for the installer. He came last Friday. In fact, we didn't know he was coming until two days before they gave us a call and said, yeah, could they move the date up that they originally told us because they'd had a cancellation? We said, sure, fine, not a problem. So the guy came, he was here for two and a half hours and uh, then he pointed out something to us, okay? Well, let me show you what our shower stall looks like right now, shall I? Shall I? Uh, let me find a picture of it. Here it is. Ain't that nice? Isn't that a lovely? Obviously, we can't use our shower stall at the moment. He ripped the base out, grabbed the new base out of his truck direct from the factory, and discovered that they had put the drain hole in the wrong place in the base. It was off to the side, not where it's supposed to be, that dirty little hole in the center. And the thing was, he was showing us all of the measurements, all the information as to exactly where that hole was supposed to be were written on a label on the side of the unit that was all wrapped up, shrink wrapped in plastic. And basically they made a mistake at the factory. Okay. So great. Here we are with this mess. So he had called his supervisor and let them know. And they, he told me, well, they're going to order it. Orders go in on Wednesdays and then come back to us on Wednesdays. Okay. So I said, so essentially that means you're not going to be here for another week or so before that comes in. And he says, yeah. And I said, okay. So I phoned the supervisor, Vivian, and I let her know how disappointed, <laughs> you hear it in my voice, how disappointed I was in this situation. And she apologized for the mix up and the whole bit. She didn't understand why this happened. Well, I can tell you why it happened. You've got people who do not communicate clearly from one individual to the next individual and they F up on things. But you know, who's the one that pays the price for this? It's the consumer, me. 
okay, at the end of the road of this. Now, I've been told that for sure that Craig, the installer that was here, he will be back out with the right part on this Friday coming and get it all fixed up. Um, yeah, um, I'm hoping that's what happens. But, you know, this company that I'm dealing with, this isn't the first mistake they have made due to miscommunication. So I am not really holding out that this is going to be all fixed up. I hope it will be. But if there's another problem, I'm anticipating I'm going to get a call about, oh, Thursday of this week telling me, yeah, there's a problem. You know, they weren't able to get the part yet or something else, blah, 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 blah. Luckily, I have other bathrooms in my house that have showers, not stalls, you know, showers in the tub kind of thing. And that's what we are using right now. So we're not going around and being real stinky and dirty or anything like that. But it is a to say the least, an inconvenience. And it's frustrating because who do you blame? Yes, I want revenge. There, I've said it. Yes, I want some heads to roll for this. You've caused me grief. I want you to feel my grief. But... There's nobody to blame. Oh, there is. There is somebody to blame. But it's so far into the chain of how things work, you don't know where, where the problem occurred. And nobody is taking responsibility for it. The supervisor or the, the person that I talked to, she's apologizing, but she didn't make the part. She contacts the factory. And there's probably somebody in there who goes out, investigates, and orders another part. But they don't know who made the part or where it screwed up along the line. And that is miscommunication. And that's why the left hand is not talking to the right hand. And this happens so often to us all the time in various areas uh, that we may be dealing with for whatever we're dealing with. Nobody takes responsibility. Nobody gives you any form of compensation. What do I mean by compensation? Well, I think I should be getting something for this inconvenience, for this aggravation, to appease me because I am the customer. Because now I'm telling you about this company. Their name is Bath Fitters. My recommendation is this. Don't deal with them. There's obviously a problem in their logistics link or system or whatever you want to call it. And there's nobody that's going to do anything for you. They're just going to pay you lip service. Oh, we're sorry. Yeah, we're sorry. You know, in an ideal world, this is what this person that I contacted should be doing. We're so sorry for the inconvenience, sir. We're going to be on this right now. We're going to get right on it. We will have this fixed up for you within 24 hours. Because you can't tell me that the factory doesn't have these things in stock. They're not custom orders. Go to your stock. Find the right one. Send it over. Someone has to work overtime to send it over. Send it over. Wasn't my fault. It's their fault. They pay for the overtime for whoever the poor sucker is that would end up sending it over. Get that installer over here. Pay him overtime and get the job done. But no, they're making me wait a minimum of a week. Now, you may think I'm being very unfair. Maybe I am. But if it had been done right the first time, you wouldn't be hearing about this, would you? And there are so many customers. Now, okay, on the other side of the fence, you could say, yeah, well, in this day and age, the way things are manufactured and delivered and installed, it's all a chain of command. And if one of those little links in the chain breaks down, then the whole thing goes to hell. Yes. But what I'm saying is, in this modern day and age of computer technology, of systems analysis, of all this kind of stuff. 
there shouldn't be these kind of, of problems. I mean, let's face it, you can love or hate Amazon. It's up to you. But you know, they seem to have a, a logistic system down pat. Like you order something, you have Prime. And well, yeah, I know there's a, a little bit of a criticism here because I have a criticism too. You know, it used to be if you had Prime, it was like next day delivery or two day delivery. And there are times when that is not the case. But even when that's not the case, they pick up the pieces very quickly, usually. Other companies don't work like that. And I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's arguments for why that is. It depends on which side of the fence you want to sit on here. But I'm sitting on the side of the fence of that they are pissing me off, bath fitters. I'm annoyed. Right now, I'm hoping that this whole situation, my little hole here, gets fixed up by the end of this week and all will be happy until the next time the damn thing cracks and I have to have another one, which is another problem in itself as well. Let's talk quality of manufacturing. Um, but that's a tale for another day. So stay tuned. Okay, that takes me to speaking of products and things. Well, we bought a couple of new things. And we were talking about these on Stephen and Walter Live. And I'm just trying to find my picture of these. I thought I had it here. I'm pretty sure I do. Um, bear with me. Yeah, I have to. So I found the pictures here. Here they are. First new toy. Well, Walter bought this toy. You know, Walter does a lot of cooking and things like that. And we do have a mix master, a sunbeam. Uh, we've had it for probably over 30 years or so. And it still works fine. But it's not a KitchenAid. This was on sale. Walter decided to get it. Now, he originally wanted it in red, but they were out of the red, but they had the silver. And does the color really matter? Not really. Silver's a little more masculine anyways. So here it is, this big hunkin' mix master. It's a KitchenAid, of course, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this brand. And... Walter didn't stop there. He liked the price of this, got that. Then he got some add-ons. He got the pasta maker that goes onto this. And he got the shredder, slicer, dicer, whatever you call it, makes Julian fries uh, for it as well. The only thing he hasn't got, and I have a feeling he may eventually, is the meat grinder that goes on it. Uh, hasn't used it yet, but will very soon. I'm especially looking forward to the pasta because we already have a pasta maker, but it's a hand crank one. And Walter does make his own fresh pasta and really there is a lot of difference between homemade fresh pasta and the dried stuff even the stuff you can buy that is supposedly fresh pasta in the store um it's just nicer all the way around and uh, you wouldn't think something as simple as pasta would make a difference whether you buy it you know on the grocery sh uh, store shelf or not or fresh but it actually does so, yep, he's got that toy. Then we had to figure out where we're storing it. He found a place, you know, uh, what I like to call his um, Nirvana closet, you know, Nirvana. You go through to the back of the wardrobe uh, and you come out in another place. Well, I swear that room that's his sewing room has so much stuff in it. I don't know where it goes. I swear it goes into another dimension. So that's where he's keeping this as well. But the other toy that I'm really excited about that he happened to find by accident is this. This is our new coffee maker. And this just is not your ordinary coffee maker. This is barista style level coffee maker. It is fantastic. It makes 12 different coffees at the push of a button. Uh, right now, you're seeing it. We had just been taking it out of the box, so we've got the drip tray off. That's why you see that red thing down the bottom. There's a cover that goes over that. It grinds your coffee. It brews your coffee. It will steam and foam your milk automatically. That little attachment, we don't have it on there in this picture uh, right now. And it does a fantastic job. I just, it's like, wow. You know, someone walks into your house and you, just, you want to pull out the cup and write their name on the side of it. You know, Cafe Mochachina for, you know, Macchiato for whoever. In fact, I'm enjoying right now, this morning, I made a Cafe, cafe Crema. 
which is really nice. It's very European. It's got the foam, like the foam on it. It's not milk. It comes from the way it's made, the coffee is. And you can program this sucker for your favorite ones. And you can have up to five profiles, meaning if you had five people in your house, each one has a profile. It's a little different color on the machine. You go in, my color's green. You push the green. I think my color's green. Yeah. And uh, whatever coffee I select on there, and I if I change the settings on it because I want a little more foam, I want a bigger cup, whatever, it remembers it. So the next time I put go into that profile, I have the green one up and I push that button for like my coffee creme, crema, cafe creme, cafe crema on here, it remembers my settings. Oh, it is a glorious thing. In fact, um, these two things are so glorious, I made a little video that I'm going to show you right now. Okay, so we bought a new toy. Wasn't in the plan, but Walter saw it online. It was on sale, and you know Walter when it comes to having a coupon offer on sale as he tries to break parts of it right now in the background. But this is our new coffee machine. This little sucker makes 12 different types of coffee. You can program it for your favorites. It'll make cappuccino. It'll foam your milk automatically. It has a grinder in it. It'll grind the beans while it makes your coffee and everything like that. I mean, this little sucker does it all except serve it to you, which I think was the next model up. But uh, it is called a Philips Seiko. And what's the official name of this? It's a uh, model 5400. And it's uh... a cup. Comes from uh, a company called. It's Philips Seiko. Philips Seiko, okay. But you can see all this. Now we just took it out of the box. We haven't even tried it yet. So I'll do a little bit more video as we go through it. But whoa, this is exciting. We're our own baristas now. Okay, so we've got the coffee maker all set up. It was basically very easy. A couple of things we had to rinse out, it said. and. Uh, that kind of thing. But Walter's now trying to register it. And there's a barcode that comes up on here, which he has an account with this company. And uh, I don't know what he's doing right now, but he's fucking around with it. Uh, <laughs> but we're going to try our first cup of coffee here in just a moment. Okay, the noise you hear right now is it's grinding our beans. And we've just selected an ordinary coffee. And it's telling you on the screen what it's doing brewing. Uh, we've got our coffee up under here, a coffee cup under here, and then you could also adjust, we already did it, what strength you want, how much you want, and whether you want two cups at the same time. Um, but right now we're just doing one simple basic brew. And the indicator says it's still brewing. We should get a nice crema, as they call it, crema. It's a little weak right now. Maybe it's because it's the first cup. Well, maybe. It said you needed to make about five cups to get it configured. Probably not a lot of beans going into the yeah, hopper yet. Yeah. But we'll, we'll try again. We'll see, but we'll see what this turns out like. Still brewing. You see all the settings on this? But you can program it up to 12. I think it's 12 settings, isn't it, on this yeah. one? It's for 12 different types. So, you know, you don't have to go in and select if you've got your cappuccino. And this is why Walter was really thrilled with this, because he loves his cappuccino. Boy, that looks like puke. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> I don't think we'll enjoy that. Just, uh, but we're going to try it again and see what happens is maybe you said two week maybe it should have gone the other way i don't know we're going to play again we're going to try again okay this is round two and this is looking a little better that looks more like coffee you can drink mind you we did adjust it to the strongest strain still looking good too no it's still looking a little said to do four or five cups well you. that may be why you, why you do it maybe it takes that whatever it has to do to get this right but we will continue to experiment and see what happens okay so it recommended that you brew five cups of coffee first for it to get configured so this was coffee number two because Walter dumped number one but it was a lot lighter 
This is coffee number three, coffee number four, and coffee number five. So now we're going to taste each one and see if we can see a difference. So this is coffee number two. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. A little better. Of course, this is the coffee we're using. We bought it from the company. We've never had this brand, so. Yeah, well, definitely the last one does taste better than the second one. Now Walter's going to try. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty watery. Still more, it's still watery, more watery than I like. It might have to do with the brand of bean. I don't yeah. know that we're using. Um, but okay, so we did the five initial ones. Let's try something like a cappuccino and see what that's like. Okay, we're brewing a cappuccino right now. So it has a milk frother built into it. We put in milk. Make weird noises. Of course, we don't have it in the proper cup for a cappuccino, but that's okay. Looks pretty, though, doesn't it? And there's a cappuccino. We didn't have a cappuccino cup in it, however. Okay, so let's taste it and see. Does it taste like cappuccino? Yeah, that tastes like that. Yeah, it's very strong. So, okay, so cappuccino, it does. So now I'm trying to make a latte macchiato. And this is what it looks like. It just went through its cycle. That has milk in it. And it says enjoy. So let's enjoy. Tastes like cappuccino, <laughs> except that's all basically it is. But yeah, I think macchiato is when they add syrup. To yeah, it, you add the syrup like and stuff to it. But uh, anyways, and that one we saved into the green profile. So if I want to make it that way again next time, we're still experimenting with it. There's lots of things you can do. Um, but I think we're going to have to try a different brand of coffee. We'll get that one from Costco that they have that's supposed to be really good. What's it called? The La, La Vaza. Or La Vaza or something, or something yeah. like that. And see what the difference is. Because I'm not really sold on this brand. And it's the company that makes it. Yeah, they, they brew it themselves in Ontario. So I'm wondering. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. twice about that. It just to me, it just. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We're still experimenting. But we do have a warranty on this and we do can return it in what was it said 90, 90 days 90 days if we don't like it I, but i think it's not the machine i think what it is is that brand of coffee yeah that's my theory uh we just tried you can put ground coffee in it as well and we just tried that a moment ago and yeah that worked okay um you know it's one of those flavored coffees they recommend you don't use flavored beans because they have an oil on them and it can uh over time can uh plug up your grinder so, but you know, quite frankly, I can never taste, uh, uh, you can smell flavored coffees, but a taste of them, I never notice any great difference. So we're still experimenting. So we bought another kind of coffee. We bought, uh, went to Costco and got La Vaza. Um, and this one has got a rating of eight out of 10 for strength, I guess, or strong flavor, whatever. 
And uh, Walter's already brewed one cup, but we had to clean the hopper out of the other beans, and there's probably still a few of those beans in there. So it may take two or three cups to run through it before we'll get the new coffee going through it. So we'll see what that's, this is like. Okay, another new toy purchased this week. Walter bought a KitchenAid, and he bought all kinds of little buzzers and bells to go with it. He's got a pasta maker for it, and you bought something else. What was the other thing you bought? The one that shreds cheese and salad. And oh, yeah. Slices, dices, makes julian fries, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, new coffee machine, new KitchenAid Mixmaster, very fancy. And Walter's now trying to figure out how it works. Attaching his so beaters. You, you put the pin and you just go like that, you know, it's mm -hmm. attached. And so that's not the one with the fancy scraper, though. You got It came with the fancy scraper that people told us about for, I guess, scraping down sides of your bowl as it mixes. And then you've got the whisk, which looks like fun as well. Ooh. And, and then there's the, um, the Nova. Oh, look at that. It's so round, round. Oh, Captain Hook. It's the dough hook. How doughy. Ooh, what are you going to make first? I don't know yet. Bread. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Pasta. Hasn't got the pasta attachment on it. It goes up here through this little hole here. So it's the little cheese shredder, or slicer, or dicer, or whatever it is. Very nice looking machine. Yes, I know. Some are going to go, well, why didn't you get the red one? Because they were. I did try to get the red one, but they were all out of stock, and I thought, what do I really care what color it is? So long it works, so long as it works. This one looks more masculine. Yeah, so there it is. So wonderful things to come. Now he has to figure out where the heck we're going to put it. And of course, besides having coffee and cake now, with all these fancy machines, we will have lots of salad and other things as well because we have our grow lights. And here is the original one. Now it is extremely jungle-like. It's gone wild on us. So Walter has cleaned this all out now, planted herbs again and lettuce because those seem to do very well on those lights. So this will now be our little herb, indoor herb and lettuce garden. Grow light number two, oops, wrong way. Grow light number two. If I can get it here, there we go. Again, we're doing a little rejuvenating of this one. Walter took tomato plants out and some of the green pepper plants and transplanted those uh, to grow light number three, which I showed you, I believe, last week. But in the meantime, now this lettuce is getting a little on the ratty, so but it's still edible. Uh, I'm not sure why we're getting some brownie leaves on it right now. Um, we don't eat those, obviously. It could be that it's a little root bound, but we're going to, you know, clean that one out and replant more lettuce in that. We have found a variety of lettuce um, that does really well under the grow lights. So we've got that. And then here is our grow op in here. Yes, that's a tomato plant, not something else. And our pepper plants. And lo and behold, um, this picture doesn't really show it. But we have, yeah, they do. They're up here. If you look closely, these little yellow things, we have flowers on our tomato plants. And where there's flowers, that means we can have tomatoes. Now, this one is hung from the ceiling, and Walter has lined the walls in this particular corner of the workshop. Uh, he has lined the walls with uh, mylar uh, to reflect the light more. Uh, he read that somewhere, that that really helps the growing process. And this light is adjustable. In fact, in this picture, you can see there's a little rope here. It's on little pulleys. And so we can raise it or lower it. And there's a little box, and you can't see it in this picture, but up here at the top, there's a little box with some dials on it. So you can dim the intensity of the lights as well. So we're experimenting with that to see what the optimal is. But... Yeah, these are our green peppers, and they've got little buds on them as well. So, can you say we're really pleased with ourselves on this? Um, it, it, it's, it'll take some time yet to see uh, whether or not, um, you know, how these work as far as what they bear with the tomatoes and the peppers, but we're hoping. Now, is this going to replace our container garden on our deck? No. This is an enhancement. This is so we can, you know, when we get this down to a routine, we'll be able to have year-round 
lettuce and tomatoes and peppers because those are three items that right now in the grocery store you have to take out a small mortgage for but we will continue to grow once out on our deck as well in fact i think what we're going to do is we're going to start walter may have already planted some of them last night from seeds more tomatoes and green peppers um get them started indoors and when the weather gets to the point and that won't be until probably about june-ish here we will transplant those plants to our containers out on our deck so yeah we're vegetable farmers at this point best part about the grow lights for these tomato plants is that the squirrels can't get at them because <laughs> we have a little problem with squirrels eating our produce and everything so yeah this experiment is working out quite well okay so uh speaking of things that we're making and whatnot i am working on a secret project with my 3d printer i'm making some things and one of those things that i'm making is something that i'm hoping i can get perfected and then i'll tell you what it is but i'm not going to tell you what it is right now yes it does involve gnomes of course it does uh but it's also a practical print and it is something more or less for quilters and sewers and that's all i'm going to tell you and that's what my printers have been madly working on so when i have it perfected or whatever then i'll talk about it in more detail so that takes me to a blast from the past in terms of trips and uh we've been looking at auckland new zealand uh in 2016 when we went on our first uh, New Zealand Australia adventure which was essentially it was a um, cruise but while we were in Auckland just before we got on the cruise ship uh, we did a wine tour and so December the 8th 2016 we did a wine tour in Auckland and here's my video of that. The view is lovely it's got a fantastic balance it's very fruity very tropical. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is mostly stainless fermented, but it has had extended lens contact in the tank. The lens. So today, our third day in Auckland, we are on a wine tour, and uh, we've just finished at our first winery, and this is the name of the winery. I'm not really sure how to say it. I think it's Camus River, Camus River something like that but this is the winery this is the company that we're with today and we're going to three different wineries we're having lunch at one of them and uh, very informative we've learned quite a lot about wine here in New Zealand and uh, well stay tuned for more the wine regions we're, we're way up here in Auckland there's a cluster of not many I think in total you're probably looking at about 12 up in the Bay of Islands around here it's very humid the equator runs through about here so you're getting very hot and sticky up here. You're going to run into all sorts of problems around fungal infections, botrytis, powdery mildew, those kind of things. They're problematic. In Auckland, the region we're in, Matakana, and our north of Auckland, Clevedon, about half an hour south, and Villa Maria Estate by the airport. That's Gisborne. It's on the east coast. They grow a lot of Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, some Riesling, and Pinotage growing there. Hawke's Bay around Napier, Hadlock, North and Hastings. This is the red wine capital. It's the second biggest growing region in Auckland, uh, in, in New Zealand. And that's where we grow all, the, all these Merlot Cabernet Francs that will always be sourced to Hawke's Bay. On the label, you should tell you, unless it's generic, unless they've drawn the grapes from various regions, it will say on the label, Hawke's Bay, Marlborough, Gisborne or St. Otago. Further down to Waipara, this is where all the earliest Pinot Noir was grown. It's 70 kilometers north of Wellington. There's some amazing Pinot Noir, but from that parallel there down, you, you cannot ripen Cabernet because the winter here, you can see New Zealand there, we are one of the most southerly regions in the world to grow grapes. So from here down, the winter comes on six weeks, progressively six weeks earlier. You just don't have that ripening length to get Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc or Syrah ripe. There'll be some small examples where you can, and maybe a microclimate, a valley, a heat, you know, heat trap in Marlborough. But mostly from here down, it's all white and Pinot Noir. Marlborough, 
top right corner around the town of Blenheim. This is the engine room for the industry. The total plantings in Auckland are something like 1.2%. The total plantings in Marlborough, 62%. 80% of the entire volume of that $1.5 billion industry come around this region. Just next to it, you have the region of Nelson. It's all white. All the Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, and, and Pinot Noir. Okay, so this is the New Zealand, Auckland area, or some place called Black Beach, which is mostly sandwich pond. But you can see the surf right here. Okay, so we're standing out here and look at this. These are all cannons. All sitting here. I don't know. They look like they might be nesting, but I'm not really sure. And there's more of them up here. And here's some more of the Black Beach. As you can see, this to me is probably what New Zealand is all about, or when you picture New Zealand. All these bluffs, the beach, and the surf. Oh, I love that bird. That's my favorite. Oh, it's so just cute. beautiful. See if we can find another picture. So would you like that one? It's okay. Yes. And why is rosé making a comeback? Because it I think it's a dry style where people might be used to the sweeter style. It's a really fruit-driven wine. It's refreshing over the summer. Um, the drier styles will go nice with seafood as well as meat. So it's all round. And it's just funny because wine goes in and out of fashion. Yeah, all the time. That's really? what the customer wants. It's um, so a good cow. Never yeah, good cow is always, yeah, that's always in That's a style. staple. Yes. <laughs> So this next one is our 2014 Riesling. Yeah, so our winemakers won three of New Zealand's best Rieslings on previous vintages. So it's an up dry style of Riesling. Mm. Um, so it's not a super sweet or it's not bone dry. It's just some mm. of the Riesling from where? Marlborough. Marlborough. Your grapes. You've got Vitis Silvestris, which are wild creeper grapes. You find them in equatorial regions. It's Vitis vinifera that we make wine from, their cultivars, and the reason they are able to be cultivated is they pollinate themselves, they're hermaphroditic flowers. Mm. So this little tiny flower here, what you start off with is this, this ball, like that, and then that little petal is going to open up and turn into this flower, and underneath that flower you're going to end up with this one, we cap like that, and that process of Pollination, if you get a, a storm come through, or a wind come through, or, or, or a deluge of rain, it'll blow all that pollen away, and it'll never set. And you get a condition which in France is called millerondage. In England, they, they loosely translate it to hen and chicken. And it means you get lots of little berries, and some berries on a, on a bunch that just never develop. And when the bunch is picked, of course, it all goes into the hopper, so you'll end up with real berries and little berries that never develop. So you're going to end up with a very high skin to juice ratio, which will increase that malic acid I talked about, and that's a problem. So the wine, before you've even picked your grapes, much of the wine, the finished product, is being made in the vineyard. Just use it one stick for each one, there should be 16 sticks for whatever it is. 
This one here is um, Alpine Borage honey. We make about 16 different varieties of honey, some of them multiflora. We make honey from avocado flowers. We make honey from this one, which is the Vipus bugloss flower, which mostly grows in the foothills of the mountains in the South Island. Um, this is Pahutikawa honey, that's the beautiful uh, um, flower that we saw. It's related to this flower over here. This is the bottle brush. We but have that in our front yard. Beautiful. In Arizona. Pahutikawa. Yeah. This one is Rewa Rewa, that's the native honeysuckle. Uh, we also make honey from tauri, uh, from um, clover, from lavender. Uh, this is the one that is the one that is the most sought after. It's medical grade UMF honey. This was studied by Professor Peter Mollen at Waikato University with a team of scientists for 20 years. They isolated this honey. Not all Manuka honey has it. Manuka is the native or Maori word for tea tree. So tea tree has been used around the world for thousands of years um, as oils, as soaps, and for health tea supplements. Tree. Yep, tea it's tea tree. Yeah. He studied this honey for 20 years and they isolated it to a chemical called methyl glyoxyl. It's an extremely effective antibiotic that in laboratory tests has been shown to be more effective than Staphylococcus aureus, which is the SA in MRSA. It is a standard treatment now in Helicobacter for the treatment of stomach ulcers and it's very effective at treating Escherichia coli, so E. coli. Mm -hmm. um, it's used mostly in the medical industry. If that number went up to 25, you would pay $140 for that. This one at a duty-free shop on average would be about $45. Mm -hmm. I buy this at one particular supermarket downtown for about 22, but it's-, it's In Auckland? Yeah. It's about $35 in the at States. At the Countdown? Yeah. At the Countdown? It's, you can get it at Countdown and you can get it at New World. They have a contract with Arateki. There's only about seven companies that have the license to use this trademark. These honeys are laboratory tested twice, one for their hydrogen peroxide count and one specifically for the level of methyl glyoxyl per litre of honey. And it's basically used for what again? It's used for the treatment especially of non-healing uh, wounds. Non-healing yeah, so wounds. wounds. So yep. I use it all the time. You rub it? You put it on wounds and you bandage. So it's called a wet to dry bandage where you put a thick amount over a wound, especially one that you can't close yourself. So it's just an open wound that's going to heal by second intention. So you just you just kind of soak the area. Kind of similar to like sugar. Lots of people will mix sugar with water and make kind of a paste, but this works much better. Now, earlier I mentioned we had a big dump of snow on the weekend on Friday night into Saturday. Stopped about mid-Saturday. And I thought you might want to see what that looked like. So looking out on my deck, that's that big lump. That's our barbecue on the deck. And you can see there's the snow. And at the time I took this picture, although you can't see it in the picture, it was still snowing. And here gives you a, more of a perspective of what it looked like outside at about mm, seven o'clock Saturday morning. It was still snowing and you can see <laughs> drifting and piled right up. And it continued to do that um, until about the early part of the afternoon. And then Walter went out and blew all that stuff away. And then by the end of Saturday, it already had started melting uh, away. It is pretty when you look at it <laughs> from this perspective. But it is March and it is time, you know, we're not that far away from the first day of spring, March the 21st. So a couple of weeks, um, we want to see it go bye-bye. We don't need it anymore. Don't want you. Okay. So that takes me to what's coming up. Well, or what in the past week, what happened, we did have craft and chat on Wednesday. That's always fun. That was a great day. I was very productive. I think everybody else was as well. Um, so we always have that on the first Wednesday of every month. So the next one will be whenever the first Wednesday of April is. And we had another pop-up so day on, I called it pop-up snow and so day on Saturday because I knew it wasn't going anywhere. And uh, a lot of other people, at least the ones in you know, Southern Ontario, where we're getting the big dump, weren't going anywhere either. So I had a pop-up so day and yeah, I've got lots of things done. And that's where I worked primarily on that wild stars quilt I showed you earlier. So I do know for those of you that are quilters and sewers who like to join in on the pop-up so day, you don't have to be a quilter or a 
so are either. You can come and work on whatever you want to work on. If you're doing some other kind of craft or another hobby, yeah, join us. Um, I will be having one for sure on March the 18th. I know that. So that's a week from this Saturday. Um, I have decided that what I'm going to do with Pop-Up So Days is if you're on my mailing list for Pop-Up So Day, you might, on the actual day I have one, get an email. Check your email first thing in the morning if you're interested. And uh, it will give you, it will let you know that, yeah, we're having a Pop-Up So Day. Here's the link kind of a thing. That's how I'm going to do it from now here on in. And I did sort of allude to the idea that uh, my sewing on demand thing I'm, is going to go bye-bye. And I think it is. This will be the new way to do it. But I'll talk more about that on the Idiot Quilter tomorrow because again, those of you that tune into the Idiot Quilter are probably more, you're, you're quilting. You're more interested in this than maybe some of you that come to this vlog. Okay. All right. Um, and I've already mentioned the fact that we have uh, so with Stephanie and Stephen on Wednesday, starting at 9 a.m. Runs for about an hour and a half uh, on Wednesday. And uh, just a reminder, long term notice, uh, my spring retreat will be on Saturday, May the 6th. And actually later today, I'm going to start working on the details, the notifications for that. And I want to send those out probably about midweek next week. So watch your email for those announcements. I will also be doing a special kind of video announcement about it too. If you're not on the mailing list, but so you can still be part of it. But if you want to be on any of my mailing lists, if you want to be on the pop-up so day mailing list, if you want to be on the craft and chat um, mailing list, and if you want to be on the retreat mailing list, please just send me a note saying which one or if you want to be on all three recommend all three um just let me know via email my email address is in the show notes below and i'll be more than happy to add you to any or all of my lists okay that's it for me i hope you have a great week uh idiot quilter will be up tomorrow um i do believe i have an interview to put up tomorrow as well and um yeah so in chat on friday probably and Stephen and walter live on next sunday so busy 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 okay i hope you have a great week and do something that makes you happy we'll talk to you later bye bye